Alright. Double line. You're over here. I'm over here? You're over here. No, no, I'll be, I'll be here. Okay. It's okay. Alright. We're gonna do it this time. Uh, <clears throat> we got a little snafu. No problem. There's your coffee. But Gang, we're going think, double live. We've got. I think we're we got we're Richard live here. here. We're live, live here. here. So, we got, this is like Facebook inception. I don't even know what's happening. I don't even know what's happening. Maybe this way. Uh, no, this is. Fine. Yeah, so, you'll be back a little bit. So, welcome everybody. Training Tuesday. It just so happens awesome. that this is on a Tuesday, and we're going to talk some more training. Uh, what I'm going to do here mm -hmm. is I'm going to get dialed in to the Facebook because I can't see the phone. If I do it this way and record it, we can save it and we can post it to yes. YouTube. And the last couple that we've done have been pretty popular on YouTube. So we'll try and do this moving forward as often as we can because it seems like there's a really big demand for information in regards to training. There it is. And oh, I'm sideways. <laughs> Hold on. That's pretty funny. Um, Hold on. There we go. And there we go. I love Dean's Dean's take on it. It's new age endurance training, and that's the idea. That's what uh, that's what I want to talk about today. Uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I've leaned on Dean quite a bit when it comes to the training element, and not just the endurance training, but the strength training. Very holistic approach, I guess, is the best way to call it. Something that. Uh, it will be very soon. We are live. It's weird to see. It is very so, weird to see, but yeah, this will help. So this will, this will. If anybody wants to ask questions, we can pick up on it. So, Josh, we are. Uh, we're slowly but surely getting there. We're gonna hone this a little bit more. Bring the production value up. I, I think they like bring the, the professionalism. Up. They like the organic. This is so organic right now. It's so organic. So why are we sitting here on Tuesday? A couple different reasons. First is, there's been a lot of people asking about uh, strength training and more, I guess in particular, as an endurance or power athlete on the bicycle, how, what sort of strength training should they do? And I thought now is a great time because when you talk about endurance on a bicycle, endurance on your feet also is a very close sister or brother to that. And this guy right here, who is sort of a, a savant in his training, is a man of many hats, has decided to um, do a pretty interesting event. Uh, he's a competitor through and through, and this event, I think, is going to be a, a test not only of what he's done training-wise up to this point, but a little bit of mental fortitude. And it just sounds like it's going to be a great time. All across the yeah, board. so can I you kind of so. give us sure give us a little background Thank, on what this event Rich. is? Um, yeah, well, first, first of all, I think it's great that I think at the ground level that a guy like Richard has literally taken it upon himself to say, you know what, um, we need to put information out there. We need to, and there's no reason to sensationalize or glamorize it. It is what it is, and. I would I would argue that since he's become a father, that that has really kind of jumped out uh, at me from the difference when he started doing a bunch of Maduro stuff to now. Anyway, um, I, I just absolutely love working with him and talking about this stuff. The event that I'm doing is a point-to-point -point relay race. Uh, it's 205, 210 miles. It goes through five state parks from northern Arkansas all the way through, uh, and we finish in Fayetteville. And so it's kind of like uh, a relay that you probably have heard of where you've got a team van, and there's a whole crew of people in there. The runners take turns uh, on these legs running the miles. And so you start a relay that you probably have heard of. A little delay, I love it. Team van. Okay. There's a whole crew of people in there. The no learning. But the, the, the best part of this race um, is that, like Richard said, it isn't just a solo endeavor, say, all right, hey, you're going to go run um, you know, 50 miles, 100 miles, whatever. Um, those are awesome, too. I've done a, an ultra marathon where it was a 55K, and it, you're just out there by yourself. It's you in the woods and some snacks and... Every so often you'll see a human being, and then every so often you'll see a rest station, and you'll, you know, wolf down a bunch of M and M's and bacon, and then just keep going. This is a little bit more structured where there's a support van, so 
I think the difference here is the pacing can be a little bit quicker. Everybody's responsible for a leg and then they rest maybe four to five hours and they keep going. So you're looking at each leg on the average of being anywhere in the neighborhood of three and a half to nine miles. And the, the elevation changes uh, are there. And each runner, there's six runners. Um, the race has one division, it's 12 runners. is kind of a, a cuckoo nut job version that's just six runners. and so everybody, each runner runs a little bit different terrain course. Now, um, I've never met these people before, so element number one. Okay, forget the fact that it's a 36 hour road race with, with uh, that you're maybe sleeping four or five hours in between running your legs. Second element is I don't know these people. I only know them through text message and email. I'm not, I don't even know what they look like. So when I show up, I'm gonna just be like, is anybody looking for a Dean Zoo? I think I'm on your team. And, um, and then the other element of it is, um, it's in, it's the weather this weekend is supposed to get pretty dicey. Now you know being in Dallas that we probably get like a handful of days that are in the 20s even, but it's forecasted to be in the 20s at night while we're running and it's, it might even snow a little bit. So that, that's fairly exciting for me. I think it's gonna be like a, a real challenge because when you, when, let me kind of like roll it into training. Anytime you train, your goal is to simulate what possibly could happen during your event or your sport or your race. You don't train just to train. Now, if you train just to be a good exerciser, you're a CrossFit competitor, right? We know, or you're in various functional fitness leagues. There are leagues for that. But if you do shift your mentality to training for a sport you're doing, say, cycling or running or triathlons or jujitsu or any kind of more traditional sport then you know that the training is supposed to simulate what the actual event is going to be like and so it's been a really fun thing to train for interval wise because it's essentially run a 10k uh, rest one to four work to rest ratio one to five and repeat and if you, if you shrink that down into what you would probably do in an hour time frame, you're looking at, hey, give me a minute to 90 seconds to two minutes of high intensity work, back it off, rest maybe five minutes, and do that again four or five times. And so it's just an extrapolation of, of, of training. I think training is kind of on this infinite scale. So it's been, it's been, really, been really fun to get ready for this thing. Okay, so <clears throat> that's what I want to dive into. We're going to get there. Yeah, but before we do that, let's back up a little bit uh, and kind of go a few years back when you started running. Now, you've you've done it all. You obviously, for those who don't know, um, very heavily involved with CrossFit Dallas Central, competed at the CrossFit Games sure. on the team. Yeah. So you're a. Strong I like to tell dude. people that that was. That was before it got really real, you know what I mean? You can still Either just show way. up. Yeah. And, okay. Either way. I'll take it. I'll take it. He's a strong, powerful dude. I mean, we're talking uh, front squat numbers, back squat numbers that were pretty damn impressive. Um, some clean jerk numbers that were, were decent. I mean, a very well-rounded athlete. But then you decided, I want to branch out. I want to be a little more holistic. You started running. Mm -hmm. And you started running. And just like most runners, you wanted to get better at running, so you yep. ran and ran and ran. Yeah. And the pendulum really started to move over to that side. Right. But then, not too long after that, you decided, wait a minute, I need to change this a little bit because I'm losing my holistic approach to training. Is right. that true? Right. No, it, you hit on the head. I think it, it really was, it marks three and a half years ago, so it was... Um, Literally the day after, I can tell you exactly when I decided I needed to run. It was the day after my uh, third daughter, Frankie, Francis, was born. So that day, um, my training buddies, they were doing a mild time trial on the track. And I thought I'd be cute because they're like, gosh, I really don't want to run. So I'm going to do this 50 nugget challenge. You can ask these guys. Ask Thomas White, Spencer Nix, Brian Shotwell. I did a 50 chicken nugget challenge where... It was two clean and jerks and two chicken nuggets every minute on the minute for 25 minutes. And man, I just bamboozled these guys for a free meal because it was not even a challenge. But I was so disgusted with myself after that. I was like, wait a minute, what am I doing? What, what is this? That 
after Frankie was born, I was like, you know what? I avoided this mild time. Why? I was like, I, I used to run. I like, I like to run. I, for some reason, I got out of that rut. And I think like a lot of people that uh, trained with barbell a lot or lifted heavy, they just think that if I run, I'm going to lose all these gains, right? Yeah. I'm going to lose all this. So I just took it upon myself to start running. And it was as, as simple as that, just run. My thing was like, how do I get good at anything? Well, I just have to do it a lot. Like take a billion steps, just run. So I remember running from my house to the gym, which is a little over 4.3, maybe four and a half miles. It took me almost an hour and a half. I mean, you're talking like I stopped multiple times. I walk. I think I started walking back towards the house at some point. Then I was like, no, no, you're already past halfway. Just keep going, keep going. And then when I got there, I was like, oh, I gotta go back. So I gotta get back somehow. Call my wife if you, Kelly can come pick me up. But anyway, um, it was then where I kind of found this. It was just another challenge. It was like, okay, I, I want to really get good at this. I'm not good at this at all anymore. And on top of it, I think. The, the thing that really got me with the endurance thing is my whole goal was I would set these micro goals like, okay, I want you to be able to get up and run a mile on demand. Not even thinking about it, go run a mile. Then that turned into, okay, two miles. That turned into 5K. That turned into, I want you to be able to get up at any moment's time and go run a 10K. And then you're right. Once you develop a certain amount of base in your sport, I'm not telling people to say, Oh, to get good at running an ultra marathon, you should just back squat and deadlift all day. Yeah. You have to acclimate to your sport. There's no other way. Cyclists especially, you have to know what it feels like to sit in a saddle for over two, three, four hours. There's no way. Runners have to know what it feels like to pound your feet on pavement or trail or whatever for hours on them. You have to let your body adapt to that. But the training came on the back end because well, how do I stay healthy? How do I get stronger? How do I produce more power per stride? That came from my background of doing strength and conditioning, doing CrossFit, where it was very midline and lower body centric stuff, where that's where I truly think it's where I've been injury free for the past almost four years, in that I've always had that strength and conditioning background and basis. The times that I felt like I was on the brink of getting hurt, we're correlating with the times that I did not spend a lot of time doing strength work. Okay, let's stop there. That's what okay. I wanted to get to is, do you know what your mileage was weekly at its peak? So when that pendulum was all the yeah. way over to the side of running? It was... Um, hours, mileage? Sure. I, I would run oh, 60 to 70 miles a week. Whoa. So you're talking about a couple days a week where they would be very long. You're talking... Okay. I mean, 12 to 15 mile stints. Other parts of the week where it would be a couple of uh, doubles, where I would run in the morning, run in the afternoon. Okay. And yeah, 60 to 70 miles a week, I think I probably held on to that for a good two months um, at one point. Okay, and I think we can probably agree that's a lot. Like, that's, that's a, lot, a lot, yeah. Especially for somebody. That's, that's peaking to marathon. Okay. I mean, that's like 105 to 120 miles is like elite level marathoners are trying to do that. So now, when you're at that mileage, you start to get some issues working in. Right. Some feet problems, some knee problems, some things like that, some breakdown issues, like right? Hips were the biggest thing hips. for me. Okay. Lower back, my left hip specifically, just could not, I just could not get a line. I felt like, because see, running and cycling are very similar in the sense that they're not, they're not, um, you're moving each limb independently of each other. So it's a staggered, it's always a staggered squat or a staggered stance position, even cycling. They're, you never cycle like this together, right? Or you never you run with You should never be really <laughs> weird. But the, the nature of that is one side of your body is always going to maybe be favored or unfavored. So I was getting a lot of left hip issues. And I, my back would go out just literally reaching down to pick up for like a light kettlebell. And that's when I was like, okay, whoa, whoa, whoa. I can feel that twinge. I can feel okay. something going on. I need to get some strength work back in. Okay, so you realize, thankfully, at that point, you got to work some strength back in. Now, let's fast forward. Like two years ago. Okay, two years yeah. ago. Let's fast forward to, uh, 
we can say now or we can back it up a little bit to where you think you were in probably your best shape. What have you backed your mileage down to weekly? Um, the highest, I mean, on average now, it's probably 30 to 40 a week. Okay. I hit a few weeks of 50 about um, three or four weeks ago because it was getting ready for this endurance race. Okay. But otherwise, um, e even in the summertime, I was probably no more, because of the weather and the heat, no more than 30 a week. Now that it's getting cooler, yeah. 40 a week is, is so, no problem. I'm not great at math, but I'm looking at this, and it looks like 340,000% less. I mean, I could be wrong. Right, it's literally half, yeah. Yeah, so we're looking at half the mileage. Now, did you see any sort of detriment in your average mile times or your ability to hit those longer runs, anything that, like you that? You know, the, the only thing that, the only thing that became a detriment was keeping my head in um, for oh, efforts yeah. longer than 90 minutes because then you're talking about the longest runs I would do were maybe nine milers. Okay. But if I wanted to stretch it um, and I wanted to just go for like 14 or 15, it got a little, it got into that zone of, oh, I'm not as familiar with this place anymore. And then you're going, I, I'm really, I'm really either like insanely blessed or just an idiot but I don't do a good job of hydrating, so I never bring in, you know. The, the That's time just that, unacceptable. The, the time that Rich and I go and do stuff, he's always handing me a bottle. I'm like, what is this? Because I just don't like to hold anything, and that's not a good enough excuse, so people at home, please hydrate. But I just never like to hold anything when I run. When I would get into the 90 minute, beyond 90 minutes is when, you know, I was like, okay, I have to bring a bottle, so I have like a, like a collapsible bottle that I bring with myself, and when I get to the, but I think that's, that was the only thing, and I found it to be almost unhealthy to dive into and stay in that two-hour running window all the time. It was just too much breakdown. Now, I can accumulate that same effect. The things that I changed were I would run shorter distance, but I would make myself heavier, so I'd wear a weight vest. Okay. So instead of going for a 10-mile effort, I would go for like a six-mile effort with a 30-pound pack. Okay. Or, or what I would do with the kids, I would push them in the stroller. I would say, okay, two, two babies in a stroller, pushing them. Instead of trying to go for a 20K run, I'll just do a 10K run with a break in between with the kiddos. And the physiological effect to me are the same. The psychological and the environmental effects of just going for that long, obviously you're not the same. Because yeah. a 20K, you're going to spend way more time on your feet. So, again, the ways to simulate that are to say, again, spend time on other machinery, like do more step-ups. Do We have a Versa Climber at, at CrossFit Dallas Central that we use. I use all the time. Nobody really uses it, but it's a great machine. I think anything where you can simulate, again, the activity of being on your feet but not necessarily being on your feet is good because come test day, which is your race, you'll, your body will at least know the sensation of that. Okay, so it, a lot of great information, and, and what I think we probably need to bring it back to so everybody understands this is we're speaking about athletes in general, but this is a pretty broad scope. Like, we can paint with a pretty big brush here. Yeah. Um, we may exclude the upper ends of elite athletes with this, but for the most part, what we're discussing here could really relate to a lot of even high-level athletes. Uh, yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely right. I mean, again, let, let's make it clear that, I mean, in a certain, there is a, I'm, I'm, I am one part strength and conditioning professional, and another part, um, like, exercise astronaut, too. Like, <laughs> it, it, it kind of is, is hand in hand, where uh, you've got to test this stuff out on yourself. And on top of it, I agree, the level of specificity has to be so high that, um, your training has to be so far on the other end because for me, yes, I enjoy running long distance. Yes, I enjoy endurance sports. But the other part of it is I also enjoy lifting weights. I also enjoy being functional to carry my kids around. I also enjoy the occasional CrossFit throwdown. I also enjoy being able to do all these activities that I don't want to exclude. Now, even with that said, 
I think if you are a professional athlete, say you are a marathon runner, and you are, I think you can still train the same way. You're just gonna have to change certain things obviously about your diet and so forth because you can't afford to gain a couple extra pounds. The thing I always talk about with running is I want to be the heaviest runner that I can be and stay injury free and still be able to do my races or do whatever. Because again, it's only going to suit me better in my life versus just specifically for my sport. So okay. there is that gray because I haven't crossed that threshold yet to where I'm saying Hey, I'm nobody's paying me money to run these races. Yeah, yet, right? <laughs> and if yeah. they do, then I would easily drop myself from 160 pounds down to 150 pounds, and I know the means to do that to make myself competitive at that at that rate. Again, and you've talked about this. Is yeah. that healthy overall? I think you take a little bit out of your overall health bucket, but you add it to your performance bucket yeah. of being competitive. So again, for me. I find it to be where, okay, maybe I'm not running a 730 mile pace for a marathon. Maybe I'm running an eight, but it's because I'm five to 10 pounds heavier than I need to be to do that. Because that would be the easiest thing to do is to drop some weight to do it. But then I can enjoy other facets of what I'm doing. Okay, so then let's keep it in the realm of the, we'll call it average athlete. Okay. And that's gonna be a, a pretty broad group of people I would say you got some people that are pretty hard chargers and I'm gonna lump myself into that but I'll, I'm okay saying I'm on the higher end of that yeah I'm a professional mountain biker but it's not what I do for a living it's not how I get paid so I think there are people that are out there that are in a similar boat what I think it comes back to and you hit on a couple of these that are very important you know 60 to 70 miles a week that's a huge amount of time oh yeah as a father yeah as a fitness professional it's hard to find that time, and there's a lot of people out there that I think are in the same boat, and what I always come back to is it's return on investment. Mm -hmm. And strength training will only give you a better return Correct. on investment. Correct. If, if you have that base, and there may be times where you need to focus on getting that 60 to 70 mile base, or if you're on the bike, 100 miles, 120 miles, even if you're an enduro rider. If you're out there and you're, you're an enduro rider and you wanna know how to get better, some of you, you're good riders, you need to pound the pavement. You need to get on a road bike or you need to get on your right. enduro bike right. and ride, ride, right. ride. Because right. you're fine in the, the stage sprints, but getting from stage one to two, three to four, six to seven, right. that's when it starts to affect you. So we gotta get that base, but once you have that base, it's about your return on investment. Absolutely. And your return on investment is gonna go up quite a bit when you mix in strength training. It's fascinating because you, you, you asked me about my mileage, so the first two, two and a half years of me running, I literally just pounded my body with running. I think it was an appropriate thing to do because it gave me about three to 4,000 base miles of, this is how you run. And I will be honest to tell you, you know, there's pose method, there's all these methods, there's people heel strike, toe strike, midfoot strike. I'm not gonna get into that. That's another can of worms. But I will tell you, if you run 5,000 miles, if you're able to still run after 5,000 miles, whether you heel strike, toe strike, midfoot strike, your body will adapt to the form of running that it is most efficiently geared towards to your build for. I'm a firm believer that not everybody, not one running style fits all. It's different. And not a, a run, one running style fits all situations. Yeah. There are times that I toe strike, there are most times I midfoot strike, and there are oftentimes I heel strike. It just depends on where you're at. You're telling me to have perfect pose method if I'm literally at the end of a 55K race and I'm tired as crap and I, I'm semi-walking. Sorry, I'm heel striking. But that doesn't mean that's unhealthy. Anyway, that's another tangent. <laughs> the, the part on the strength training is when, when you hear about people talking about garbage miles, and I don't really think there's a such thing as a garbage mile. But it's kind of like when you eat food at my house, if you're gonna eat, if you wanna eat a piece of candy, some folks would call that junk food, whatever. I don't care if you wanna eat candy, but you gotta give me some veggies. You gotta give me some protein. Our rule is, it's always eggs. We go through so many eggs because of that. You guys want ice cream tonight? Awesome. Everybody's gotta need an extra egg for dinner. Fair enough, eggs easy to put down, no problem. We want pancakes for breakfast. Awesome, here's scrambled eggs too. Okay, I'll cram one down. 
That's how it is. You want to go for extra run? Listen, I go running half the time because uh, my wife says, like, I think the more kids we have, the longer your runs become. Like, yeah, that's absolutely. I need time to meditate. I need time to listen to audiobooks. I need time to just think about things. I need time to pray. That's what I do when I run. It's, it's gotten to that point. So there are times where I just go for a five, six mile run because I just need some 45 minutes of time just to myself. I don't think that's a garbage, those are garbage miles because they satisfy what I'm trying to do. But I know if I do that kind of volume of running on the other end, I'm going to also give myself an extra 30 minutes or an extra 45 minutes of some strength work or some mobility work or some work on my midline. So those are things that, again, if you're going to bump up your mileage, you're gonna to have to match that with some, what I call indoor training because that's gonna keep you strong. Well, it's not only going to keep you strong, but it comes to the second point that you brought up, and that's injury prevention. Uh, and there's two ways to look at this. I think uh, <clears throat> the stronger you are, the more well-rounded you are, the safer you're going to be because when you back down your miles a little bit, be it on the bike or running, you're not going to get as many of those overuse injuries. Right. And what the hope is, if you're doing some strength training, you're doing some prehab, some mobility, some rehab. So we have injury prevention from that standpoint. But also, and not so much running, but I mean, maybe on the trail run you're gonna be doing, but especially on the bike, injury prevention in being a stronger athlete. You're a stronger person, especially riding enduro. A lot of people crash. And what yep. you end up seeing yep. is a lot of clavicle, a lot of mm -hmm. shoulder issues. And my thought process is, I'm okay to say, I've stacked it up a lot on race runs, on practice runs, and thankfully, I've never broken a collarbone, we'll knock on wood, uh, and part of that I think is because I have a lot of upper body strength, yeah. I brought yeah. that into that round, yeah, and I think that's, that's really important, not only is it for you know being able to maneuver the bike, that strength is a benefit, but there will be crashes, there will be falls when you're trail running. Why, why do you think football players are built the way they are? Why do you think a running back looks like the way they do? Deliver it's the because it's, the it's abuse. It's physical abuse. You're cycling, especially enduro. There's a lot of crap. You, if you're not, if you're not spilling, you're not thrilled. I mean, you're, not, <laughs> you're not going fast enough. You know what I mean? You're not hitting it hard enough. Yep. If you're not getting into accidents on a bike, you're not pushing the limits. You're not pushing the needle up. The same token on running, running you don't crash as much. You don't like trip and fall down the hill. You know, but live and learn. I didn't know I could get a call while I that was happening. Let's see if it's gonna resume. There we go. Fun fact. If your midline's not intact, it's it's pretty simple. Your posture fades. You're slumped over like this running. Guess what's gonna happen? Your bones aren't stacked. Pressure's on your low back. Pressure on the low back gets displaced to your knees, to your ankles, and it's just a matter of time before the wear and tear injury, or you'll roll an ankle, you'll, you'll hurt your hip or your knee on a bad landing, on a bike especially. If you don't have midline strength and you're cowled over like this, you're gonna get tired, you're going to make a mistake, you're going to crash, and that, that's when injuries happen. So I, I, I don't know, that, that is probably the, the one thing that's often overlooked for injury prevention. It's always like, oh man, I think I'm, I'm just not flexible enough uh, when I'm a runner or a cyclist. I like to argue that the strength is lacking there. I think yeah. if you, we had more strength, it, it, it'd be, be way better. So <clears throat> we've talked a lot about the necessity of strength training, why we should do it, why it's a benefit. Give us a little bit of an insight as to what sort of training you're doing, so an idea yeah. of some of the movements maybe what the split looks like, sure. how many times per week, things like that. So, um, running-wise, I stick to a pretty standard protocol. And, and honestly, like nowadays with the running, it's not as structured because uh, obviously the type of race I'm doing is, is more interval. So, I, you talk about the timing of running. I try to get in as much running as I can. Now, I will say that once a week, it's usually something that's a little bit more intense. Maybe it's a way shorter distance, but uh, intervals on the track or on hill. Like I'll do a lot of hill sprints where it's just repeats. Um, super healthy for you. It's, you really can't get hurt doing hill repeat. I mean, you can hurt yourself doing it. You just won't get hurt. Now, 
Um, the, the other days are kind of like, man, let me see where I can fit these runs in. Usually, again, if I coach early at 5.30 in the morning, I'm up at 4.30, I'll get a run in before that. Um, two or three times a week, I'll take the babies on a long run with my wife. She'll ride her bike, we'll run, we'll stop at a park, go get coffee, run home. There'll be times where I get to run to the gym, run home. On the weekends, I get up super early on Saturday to go for a run, and then I'll make it even more challenging by bringing like a sack of donuts home. I tell you what, just That's a pound of right donuts there. in your hand when you're running, it throws of it, it's, wow. <laughs> I've snuck a couple, don't worry. I don't know. Um, the strength training is very much more calculated. So I have a coach, he's a fellow coach at CrossFit Dallas Central, his name is Brian Shotwell. He's got a, a program called Honey Beer Training. Honey Beer. He is, and this is what's really cool about the strength and conditioning world. He's not an endurance athlete yet. He's not an endurance athlete, but he is a barbell specialist. He is very proficient in Olympic weightlifting movements. He's probably one of the strongest coaches at our gym, uh, pound for pound, raw weight wise. And he approaches, he studies the sport of running and he says, well, this is repetitive. Running is literally a repetitive use injury prevention. That's how, how can I prevent you from getting hurt? Yes. So he's saying, okay, well, you need a lot of single leg work, you need a lot of midline work, and you need a lot of shoulder and thoracic mobility work. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait a minute here. Yeah. You got me confused. Yeah. To be better at running, you yeah. don't just run. No. This this Brian Shotwell character seems to be using a scientific approach. Yeah. To this? Much so. I don't understand. An, an anatomy and physiology approach? Um, yeah, that's right. So it's pretty simple. The strength component, you need strength to run. Mm -hmm. Plain and simple. And 100%. <laughs> working that, uh, not running, I think is, you're gonna gain some strength running, of course, but sure. you're gonna get acclimation, you're gonna get capacity. Right. Um, to build strength, you need strength movements. Correct. Plain and simple. Correct. And there's specific and, movements and this that, is that, that yeah, We've talked about a lot, Brian and I talked about a lot into it, um, I've developed a program for Run On, which is a local uh, running store. They have a running club. They've got a ton of folks in that club. And um, working with Mitch Hayes over there, he's their run coach. Um, I've helped develop a strength program that is literally specific, yet very general. You know, I, I, it's so hard to, to kind of almost, it's almost kind of like, it's like the hardest thing to explain, but the specifics of it is, okay, this is, the specifics of the strength training is more things that you don't need to be doing. Let's be honest and just say, you don't have to do these things. I couldn't tell you the last time that I actually did a full snatch, like an Olympic weightlifting snatch. There's no reason to. There's no reason for me to do it right now. There's no. But why do athletes snatch? It's for power production. Mm -hmm. So. If I can get that with uh, not having to put my body into a position that, again, I don't want to, I want to minimize risk for my sport. That's well, an advanced movement. Correct, it is. Now, it wouldn't be inappropriate for me to do because Brian has me doing power snatches a lot. <clears throat> but what if I change the implement to a dumbbell or a kettlebell? Okay, cool, let's hit. What if I change the implement to a weighted jump? Okay, what if I change that implement to a seated box jump? So again, you can tailor this if you understand the approach of what we're trying to do. And again, strength training becomes just this infinite world of diving into movements that, again, will ultimately help you and will mimic what you're trying to do. So you're saying you've had great success with this program through Run On for runners. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, we've got quite a few so, people signing up. Wait a minute. Maybe it would be a good idea to then implement a program geared more for, I don't know, athletes on the bike? Hmm. So, let's go into some more specifics about what sort of movements are you doing? Sure. So, you're a runner. Let's look at some yep. of the lower body movements. Um, lower body, and it, 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 well again, the strength work to preserve certain muscle groups to have fuel in the tank essentially to still perform my sport, my squatting changes from uh, traditional front squats, back squats to a lot of box squatting, 
um, a wide stance uh, west side barbell method box squat where it's more hamstring engagement on a squat, but there's still a little bit of, because uh, again, cycling and running, it can be fairly quad dominant in those where the hamstrings kind of get avoided a little bit. So the squats that I do are a little bit more hamstring specific. So box squatting is one of the things that we do a lot. Um, a goblet squat or any type of squat where you're loaded in the front rack. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be in a front rack, traditionally like in a front squat, but a lot of zercher. Zercher yeah. is a term for carrying so something Holding right something here. like this like a or a goblet is you're right. holding something, which it could be any implement you have at home. Because now you're, now you're taxing you're loading the rest of them. Exactly. Yeah. Any squat move, uh, single leg squats. You're talking about a Bulgarian split squat, which is an elevated split minute. squat. Lunging. Proper pronunciation. It's Bulgarian split squat. Right. Sorry. I'm you sorry. have to speak like Eastern European. Third, third language. So, um, a lot of split squat work. Bulgarian a lot of split squat. A ton, ton of deadlifts. Ton, ton of deadlifts. Ton of deadlifts. Ton and of again, that's, that's interesting because when the term deadlift comes up, especially with more endurance based athletes, you get kind of a cringe like, ooh, can't going to hurt my lower back with the deadlift. That's sure. what a lot of people think. You can address tightness a million different ways. When we talk about deadlift, we're literally just talking about engaging the posterior chain to pick up something. So wait the a minute. Now, we've come up on another term that is one of my favorites, and that is? Posterior chain. Posterior chain, which is it's the muscles you can't see in the mirror. It's for go. The non-show. Yeah, and might be the most important thing. Absolutely. Your hamstrings, your glutes. Your erectors. spinal erectors, yeah. so incredibly important. I don't care what kind of athlete you are. And that's something that I think is commonly overlooked. A lot of endurance athletes have horrible posture. And I'm, I'm talking to you guys. Horrible Man. posture. Because so, they lack strength in the erectors in the thoracic midline. And what they do is they break down. As the event goes on, they break down and break down. And think about the more that you do anterior muscles. Nothing wrong with working anterior muscles. Abdominals. Pecs, shoulders, oh, yeah. wise. But then, if you're already in this position, you work more anterior, you get more and more flexion this way. Again, you're just opening up yourself for vulnerability. Well, another thing, if you're going further upstream, is lats and scapula. Okay, hang on. Now, now we're you're getting, talking. We're getting, yeah, we're getting, we're getting, getting up there. Let's, let's stick with. Because that's the slower body. So, okay. a lot of squats. A lot of squats, a lot of Varying body. squats, unilateral movements, single leg movements, Bulgarian split squat, uh, lunges. Lunges, walking lunges, reverse lunges, there's so many different things you can do. But then for the hamstring, we're talking a lot of deadlifts. Deadlift, traditional deadlifts, case. we're talking about sumo deadlift, which is a wide stance, hands in the middle. Um, we're talking a ton of single leg deadlift Ooh, with dumbbells the, and kettlebells. The, the suitcase. Suitcase deadlift. Single arm suitcase deadlift. One of my absolute favorites. It's been programmed in my training quite a bit. And I really enjoy that one because part of it is because you, you and, and for folks that are if we're talking about folks that are short on time and equipment and you don't need a lot of equipment for this you no. don't need 400 pounds on the barbell to deadlift and also you don't you can't afford to just deadlift once a month see when you go traditional deadlift two rep max heavy single three rep max you can't do that twice a week you mm -hmm. just can't you can't bring it your CNS can't bring it your musculature can't bring it but if we do a ton of single leg work and we mix it up with uh, various kettlebell deadlifts or suitcase deadlifts, single leg deadlifts, sumo deadlifts, you can actually train deadlift a couple times a week without yeah. getting obliterated. Yeah. And that's, that's important to understand too. That's where the programming comes in. You only have so much output to give. You can't go 10 tenths all the time. And I think that's important where some people, they think I have to train hard all the time. Well, that's definitely a relative thing. Um, you're gonna see some gains. I just saw a Dealing question over here. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin asked. Kevin, uh, this is a good question. I'm curious if you do any power measurements when it comes to your running. For example, the bike training is used using power to measure F FTP. Is there a running equivalent? Absolutely. I used this thing for about uh, nine months and I stopped. It's called Stride. S T R Y D. It's a little. It, well, I had the first generation Stride unit, which it was a heart rate monitor, but it also measured. Uh, your cadence and it, so it did this complicated calculation to measure your power output for run. It was really awesome for teaching me about run economy because at different parts, uh, it, it, 
this is so environmental when it comes to running because if your terrain changes, if your elevation changes, if the temperature changes, if the humidity changes, your pace should change in relationship to that. So it taught me to be very, very patient and smart with my pacing because if it just felt five degrees hotter, it didn't have to actually be five degrees hotter. If me subjectively, my body is going through five degrees hotter, then I knew I had to back off my pace in order to not increase my power output of running. See, in cycling, you wanna look for increased power output over a long time. In running, if you're doing super long distances, you wanna be efficient and say, am I bleeding out power right now? I'm going up a hill that is going to end. There is no reason for me to stay at, say, uh, you know, whatever watts, 250 watts right now. There's no reason for me to stay there. Let me back it down to 200, so then when I'm going downhill, then I can pick up the pace. So those are, that's a great question, but there are ways to do uh, stuff like that with runners, and that device stride is, is the best thing I've found on the market. Yeah, Kevin's actually getting ready. I think he said this weekend he's doing a half marathon, and his goal is to get to where he does, I believe, a full Ironman distance trial. Oh, awesome. Yes, <clears throat> and Kevin, I have no brains. doubt. Uh, I have no doubt he's going to get there. The guy's a pretty phenomenal athlete. We got a couple other questions, but let's keep going on this so we finish. Well, let's let's Maybe hit. We'll come. Let's yeah. hit one first. Uh, Gabriel okay. asked one about: yeah. Is it better to train early or later in the day? I mean, that's a man. That is, for me, it's very subjective because of my schedule. Um, that's yeah, and I, I think that's the no best choice. answer. Is, it's no choice. And I'll even take it to one more layer uh, under the onion of specificity for me is just the way I fuel and feed. I, I've, I operate on a compressed feeding window, which means I eat, uh, I have a six to eight hour window where I eat all my food. So I have to get my training out early before my initial insulin spike. So most of my, especially my long endurance stuff, my long runs or rides happen early in the morning before I even ingest any food. And then even on top of that, I'll have some fat immediately post ride or run, and then I go into strength training, and then that's when I introduce all the food, like the carbohydrates and stuff is after strength training. So for me, it kind of has to be early in the day, and also by like 2.30, my kids are out of school, like I'm, I, you'll never, you won't see me from 2.30 till like the next morning, because I just, I'm, I'm gonna spend time with my family. So. Um, in a perfect world, uh, and I think I've kind of dialed it in as much as I can, like earlier, I think the earlier the better. Yeah, there's so many factors, Gabriel, so many factors, and I'll give you mine personally for the longest time. Strength training in the morning really wasn't an option because right. I would wake up very sore, not necessarily sore, but um, it would take me a while to get going. I think yeah, a lot of it was inflammation and especially when it gets into this time of the year where it's colder in the morning. But what I can tell you is, since I've dialed in my nutrition and eliminated a lot of the things that had caused that inflammation, I now am okay getting up in the morning and doing strength training. And for me, that's really helped me a lot because I personally like to train in the morning on an empty stomach. I'll get up, I'll yeah, have some coconut here. butter, and I'll have some coffee, and I love to train that way. That, that helps me. I'm a bigger, more muscular guy, so I'm not concerned about having fuel. My body has plenty of fat to fuel on, and I'm even okay if it burns some of the muscle I have. So same, for same. me, for my schedule, it makes sense. I think it comes down to you got to look at you need to train first off. So if you can fit it in in the evening or you can fit it, it in the matter. morning. It doesn't matter. It's not going to move the dial that Yeah, once, once you get that figured We're out. We're not that – yeah, need a yeah. Where our bodies are are not that right. We're not there fickle. yet. We're not there yet. Yeah, and yeah. and I, I have a I have a wild theory of circadian rhythm, and I've kind of started dabbling into this. I don't actually think we as humans are on a twenty four hour circadian rhythm. I think we're actually on like a thirty two hour. I I know it sounds crazy, Just but the fact that is we're twenty four hours because that's that's like the revolution of the Earth around the sun. And the, okay. But again, I'm getting, I'm getting crazy into it. Let's let's get Megan's question yeah. real quick. Megan, Megan. Uh, do you recommend training runs rides based on time or distance or a mix of the two? I'm going to yield to yeah. I I, I think it's a mix of both because again, you've got to understand the psychological component of burnout. If you're always looking at uh, distance, then the first thing you're looking at is pace. If I say I'm running six miles today, 
I'm obsessed with my pace because I'm trying to figure out when I'm getting done. And that's not always healthy in my opinion because one, it can be, you can develop this, this almost this hatred for the distance that you're running because you're counting down the minutes of when it's done. Conversely, if you're just looking at time and you're training for a specific distance, you might be undershooting how much you need to step it up to get to that point. So I think a mix of the two is great. I think a lot of it is prioritized based on what season you're in. If you're in the season of, I am gunning for a, I'm running a full marathon, you need to be focused a little bit on the distance because, hey, we need to get to that point. But if you're saying, I'm just generally trying to be fit for now, this is kind of my, there's no races coming up, I'm gonna look more at time because it's just an easier way to, for me to say, okay, I've got an hour to run. I'm gonna go 30 minutes out, 30 minutes. I love out and back runs yeah. for that reason because you can, you can dictate your training. Same thing with riding. And I think it's important to mix both elements. Uh, just about the past four or five months, I've gotten back into cycling. I used to cycle a lot six, seven years ago. Just part of this of dropping to 30, 40 miles a week I wanted to still in, in, keep up my aerobic efforts. Riding has been a great compliment to running. And I think vice versa, you would attest that running yeah. is a great compliment to riding. Yeah. Yeah, so I've, I think, I've just started mixing some running back in and actually I'm pretty pumped. And yesterday was a five miler. Two days before that was a five miler and I feel absolutely awesome. Right, and, so. and here's the great thing about this. Th that's his fitness coming to a testament right here because I'm the same way like I mean I think I hopped on like a couple Saturdays ago for a nice like 45 miler and it was like it took me a while to get to that point because I just physically right a ride my ride sorry not a ride <laughs> my crotch couldn't handle sitting in the seat my hand was going numb from being on the hood once I got over that and my body was adapted to that my fitness could carry me into these at endeavors that you would almost be like, whoa, I have I had to ride a long time to get to that point. Same thing with Rich. His legs are strong. His feet just have to get acclimated. His yeah. shins have to get acclimated to the pounding, and then his fitness takes over there. So that's what's great about the strength training is it allows you to adapt, and, and we've been talking about doing a triathlon. It would allow us to get into that very quickly where there's not a big fitness curve there might be a big learning curve as far as learning how to swim ride a bike etc yeah. but the fitness curve is small well and coming back to just enjoying life a little bit more we was it last might have been the weekend before last we decided man we get we're gonna do some training on sunday and we came up with uh, a fitness triathlon which turned into the dadathlon right. which was a row run and bike ride and yeah, the run was only going to be a 5K, but I really hadn't run much leading up to sure. it. I'm kind of nervous. And but most sprint tries are 5Ks. Yeah. I mean, and it was it was awesome. The run wasn't an issue. Yeah, I had some shin splints after, but uh, it was cool to be able to just drop in and be able to row, run, and ride and not have any ill effects. We literally after. did it like 6 in the morning on Sunday, and then we saw each other at church like an hour later. It was like, like nothing happened, you know? And again, we're not saying like, oh, man, you should get to that... But again, that's fitness. I think that's a bigger show of fitness on its uh, at its at its like finest. As far as that's why we do the strength work. That's why Rich does so much additional work other than just riding, and at some seasons more than the riding, and for me more than the running, because again, that's the you gotta you, that's your kind of insurance policy behind all that, to where it's not worth doing something if I can't just go and do it. I can't just, a buddy of mine's like, hey, we're gonna go on this like 30 mile bike ride, Are you in? Ah, man, you gotta give me like six months. Let me get, uh, let me get ready. Or, hey man, we're gonna go like, you know, run a little five mile. You get, ooh, that's probably yeah. a year. You know, but, you know, you don't wanna, you don't wanna be in that position. Um, yeah, that's, I think it all comes back around to being a little bit more holistic uh, being somewhat of an athlete, you're going to be better at life. If, if you're a little bit stronger, everything you do in life will be a little bit better. And we've talked a lot about the lower body movements to get there. Let's kind of start to wrap this thing up because we're getting deep into this. Let's just talk a few upper body movements. Yeah, yeah. And then just a little bit of, of like Metcon work. So, you know, we have, let's talk, you know, 
we said a lower body couple movements. We're doing a split squat for some decent reps into a one arm dumbbell deadlift. And we go through that four or five times, then we move into a little bit of an upper body combination, complex, whatever you want to call it. What would that look like? Um, so upper body, again, a ton of carries, a lot of static carrying, meaning you're literally just picking up something heavy, putting it over your head, and then walking with it. Dan John is a very famous strength conditioning coach. And uh, at one of his seminars, somebody asked him, how do I get stronger? It's a great question. And um, the answer he said was, well, pardon my French, everybody, find some heavy shit, pick up heavy shit, put it over your head, and then walk with it. So that's essentially what I do for a lot of upper body work, is carrying things, picking things up, anything that activates my lats and my shoulder blades to be in a better posture. Again, if you run with better posture, not only does it prevent injury, but what's the one thing we have to, we have to manage when we're endurance athletes? More than anything else, more than fueling or anything. You, something you do like 30 times to 40 times a minute. Just breathe. Yeah. If I am in this position and I've got this internal rotation in my shoulders, I'm literally caving my chest cavity. I can't breathe. Well, my lung capacity is reduced just because of the fact of my position. If I've got stronger lats, if I've got stronger shoulder blades, it pulls me open, then I can actually stand with good posture and I can actually breathe better, exchange oxygen, exchange uh, oxygen that's need, fresh oxygen is needed for substrates so I can keep doing what I'm doing. So I do a lot of upper body pulls, so a lot of bent over rows, a lot of upright rows. Very quickly though, yeah. you just said, what you just talked about, I could combine that, right? I could hold two implements Absolutely. while doing my squats. Absolutely. And I'm Got working both ends. Or return on investment. One of, one of my favorite things um, that Brian has me do a lot is I carry an object and then I drag an object. So I'm attached to a sled. So that's working hamstrings, glutes. Because if you've ever dragged a sled, your, your backside is on fire. Yes. And then I carry something up top. So that's training my thoracic shoulders, my, my upper back, my lats, my shoulder blades, everything that's required to hold something upright. Because if I can't, because if I can't breathe, I've got to find the best posture to breathe from. So um, yeah, it, it looks very much like, it's funny because it looks like I'm doing like a bodybuilding circuit where it's like bent over rows, single arm bent over rows. Then I go right into a bench press, shoulder press, or I even simply a push-up. Cuban rotations, push-ups, pull-ups. I do just the insane amount of pull-ups all the time. Pull-ups, weighted pull-ups, um, you know, any kind of rope climbs. Yeah. I do a ton of rope climbs, and that's kind of like the, the funner elements of you throwing. It keeps, still keeps me sharp for potential CrossFit workouts I want to jump into. So um, if somebody's at a lower level, sure. let's talk, I mean, push-ups alone. For some of you out there who don't do any strength training, just progressing through push-ups, you could do that honestly for a year. Push-ups, and, and there's there's so right. many different then, things you could do with push-ups, and then work your way into some sort of pull, some sort of, some horizontal sort of scap, pull. yeah, That's horizontal it. pull, some scap retraction, which you you can get a band. You, exactly. You can, so for a lot of the run-on uh, folks that I program for that have don't have access to weight room or don't have very much strength conditioning background, the option literally is actually you just need two pieces of equipment to do this. You need a pair of dumbbells and you need a stretch band, like a plain old ten dollar stretch band you get at you know Dick's. And we do a ton of pulling from that. If at the most basic level you attach that thing to a wall or to a post and you pull, that's what you need as far as um, uh, that's all you really need for upper body until you develop more and then you start doing more external load. But a resistance band training is great. I mean it's definitely something that I get into. Even if you're in a health club and you only have access to a row machine or a lat pull down machine, yeah. do that. It's some kind of upper body pull, which is tremendously important. Which, if you're doing that, you could do varying grips. Yeah. I could do a reverse grip narrow, I could get a little bit wider, I could do it overhand, I could do a lot of different things Absolutely. with that. Very controlled movements. Same thing with the push ups. I can vary my hand position, I can vary where my hands are or where my upper body is in relation to my hands. Uh, I can also elevate my feet to make it a little bit more difficult. So and you gotta keep it simple. Good posture. Your people are always like, "When do you work your core?" 
I do accessory core work on top of that, yes. That's because of my training volume and age. But if you're doing a deadlift properly, if you're doing an upper body pull properly, you have to be engaged in your core all, the whole time. There's no room for just getting wiggly in your midline. So if you're gonna be doing a single leg deadlift and you don't have the right, you're not gonna do it right unless your core is engaged. So when you work abs all the time, you're yeah. literally working at all, any time that you're trying to control weight. Yeah, all of these movements when you're doing them, when you're doing a Bulgarian split squat, when you're doing a one-armed dumbbell deadlift, be specific, be very specific and very intent the entire movement. Yeah. And that's the thing is, I've had people ask me in the gym, man, what, what are you doing? Like, you're, you're very into your movements. It's like, yeah, I'm very yeah, into that's my all movements. It. When I'm doing a, a one-armed suitcase <laughs> deadlift, uh, I have to be tight the whole time because if I'm not, something's gonna move it's, uh, and it's gonna be an issue. It's the 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 like the you know the really popular term around is the mind muscle connection. If you're thinking about it, then you're you're about it. Like yeah. um, a lot of I do a lot of kettlebell flow work on my own. Like I have some kettlebells at home, and sometimes I'm just in the yard, 20, 30 minutes. And there's no rhyme or reason. It's like a one-arm swing to a one-arm upright pull to a one-arm snatch to a clean to a press to a windmill to a split squat to a goblet squat to a swing to a rotation whatever I want to do to a Turkish get up and again just being mindful and thinking about the kettlebell being connected to my hand and moving it I'll be done 20-30 minutes and I'm blasted yeah. like especially in my midline I like next morning like did I just do like a thousand crunches? <laughs> no, I didn't do a thousand crunches because yeah. that doesn't work. Instead, uh, I, I moved a heavy object around. Well, <clears throat> I think we got into a lot here. Uh, this was going to be kind of open. Uh, we came up with this fairly late, but I thought it was great to talk to Dean about what he's doing to train for this event and to, again, try to highlight and open everybody's eyes to the fact that I don't care what sort of endurance athlete you are, the strength training component is gonna be very important, it's Absolutely. gonna help you. It's not gonna hurt you, trust me, it's gonna help you, not only in your sport endeavors, but I think also just at life in general. And that's, I think something we can all agree is what we all want. Right. So hopefully this was eye-opening uh, for some people. We had some great questions on both of these and we'll get back, we'll circle around. Sure. We'll answer them in a little bit we'll more, like a more in depth. Follow up after the race. Yeah. See what happens. Yeah, we'll yeah. do a follow up and see, but we've touched on a few other things that I want to talk about. Some kettlebell flow. Uh, I love to get a little bit more in depth with the kettlebell because that's something that as far as an implement goes, somebody could buy uh, a 35 pound kettlebell, pretty, just one and be able to do a lot of work with that. So we're definitely going to do more of this in the future. What I ask of everybody, give us feedback. Yeah, absolutely. We want to know what you liked. Um, and don't talk about the logistics. We're still working on that. Okay, this is going to be very organic. But the idea is give it's us your live, feedback. People. Give us your feedback. Ask questions. And we'll round those questions up. And those can help. Uh, and I just want to answer two questions from my live feed from Mika, Greg. Mika, what's up, man? Um, in what role does stretching and yoga play in your fitness Bicycle. Namaste. It, 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 again, it 100% uh, depends on how much time you have for that. For me, when I do my running, I get super tight. I usually run, and within 10 minutes of me finishing running, I'm right into my strength work. So my strength work, because I take my body through full range of motion, becomes a means of stretching for me because I'm not pushing the intensity so hard to where I can't focus on what I'm doing. So instead of just doing a press to here and I can take it all the way overhead, that's actually stretching me out. Same thing for deadlift squatting. Crystal talks about, Crystal says, I wanna start training for triathlon and running is so hard for me. It seemed kind of overwhelming to get in a good routine. Again, Crystal, you would be a great candidate for saying, just focus on the time that you're spending running, not the distance. Say, today, and from now until two weeks, every day I'm gonna run for 10 minutes a day. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about how far you cover. Then the next two weeks, you increase that time to 15, to 20. The next thing you know it, you've gone on a 35, 40 minute run, you're like, whoa, I couldn't do this a month ago. Then we can start introducing, okay, now that you've ran for 45 minutes, let's see how much distance you can cover. Can we do, say, five miles? Okay, can we do five and a half? Can we do four? 
So I would always focus on that first. Focus on the time first and give yourself a limit there so just so you don't burn out and then you're always staring at the clock and saying, what's my pace, what's my pace, what's my pace, what's my pace? Don't worry about that. Just get comfortable running. Find something, like if you need distractions, get an audio book, okay? Like listen to podcasts, not just music. Cause music can just, sometimes music gets annoying. You're like, ah, there's so much... The beat's so fast, like you're trying to keep up. I'm telling you, when you, people are talking, you can always run faster than someone talking to you about, like, you know, self-improvement. So I love podcasts and books, and, uh, you know, if you're into it, like, sermons and stuff on, on uh, audio. All right, so we're going to wrap this up. Thanks for everybody who tuned in. We actually had some decent numbers. I think I saw, like, 11 on Dean's. That's uh, probably all my family members. I might have hit six. That's, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. Really. So, again, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We have some great content coming. Uh, we kind of scratch the surface of a few things we're working on, but the idea is content, 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 things that will help, things that are educational, yeah. inspirational, entertaining as well. So keep your eyes out. My athlete Facebook page, also my Instagram, at the Rich Drew, Dean's Instagram, at Dean Zoo. Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Mr. Brian Shotwell, Honey Beer Training. You can look him up on Instagram as well. And Oh, yeah. it's Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, CFDC, this of course. the gym where everything happens. That's the gym where it all happens. CrossFit Dallas Central. So, cut from a different cloth. Cut from a different yeah. cloth. So, so thank you, Dean. Brain. I appreciate it, as always. Great input. And I look forward to when we're doing it again. Tuesday afternoon, that means you got a lot of week left to get out and, and charge it. Do something good. Have a smile on your face. Um, get out there. Have fun. Train hard. Enjoy your life. You gotta look cool until I turn yeah. it off.